Lutheran Church in Metropolis, Illinois. We make our beginning tonight in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When news about the coronavirus broke out in America, all of a sudden people were buying up toilet paper and hand sanitizer and Lysol. I've noticed articles uh, since then, articles in the paper, uh, noting that things were having shortages or increased sales. Uh, first condoms and then alcoholic beverages and then of all things Bibles. The sales of Bibles had greatly increased among other things. This got me to thinking, what or who are you depending on? What or who do you trust to get yourself through this or any crisis? Do you depend on the government? Do you depend, depend on sensual pleasures? Or your own efforts or good habits? Or do you depend on God? Where is your trust? In whom do you put it? From a biblical point of view, I believe most of the crises we suffer are a result, ultimately, of forgetting or forsaking God. And that works on the individual as well as a national level. Our best hope, and our only real hope, of lasting success as individuals or as a nation, or as the church, Either way, it lies in a return to God. If we return to God, such as the Bible outlines in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 13 and 14, then whatever we experience will not have been in vain, for we will draw close to God and we will be blessed. This is Good Friday, the day on which we commemorate Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus died on the cross to take the punishment for our sins. Or as the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's why we call it Good Friday. If you haven't already, I recommend you turn to Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, and then read the crucifixion accounts in the Gospels again. In Psalm 22, it is as if David is right there at the foot of the cross with Mary and John and the women. Or, it's as if he were recording Jesus' own thoughts and words as he hung there on the cross. In Isaiah, begin at chapter 52, verse 13, and read through chapter 53. There, Isaiah tells not only what was happening on the cross, but why. It is called the Song of the Suffering Servant. This evening, we're reading a harmony of the four Gospels, that is, the story of Jesus' crucifixion using verses from all four Gospels. After that, I'll bring a short message. First, let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless the reading, the preaching, the, and the hearing of your word. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to understand, and our lives to obey, that we receive life and every blessing from your word. For your words are spirit, and they are life. Amen. And now we'll read the uh, gospel account of the crucifixion. Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified, so the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they <coughs> crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And they divided up their clothes by ca his clothes by casting lots. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, 
What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of, the, of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. When all the people who had gathered together to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the woman, women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. 
So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. He placed it in his own new tomb. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus bought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Thank you. Jesus, while dying on the cross, is reported in the Gospels as having made seven distinctive statements. We call these the seven words from the cross. Matthew and Mark record the same saying. Luke reports three others, and John quotes three completely different ones. This evening I want to read those statements and show from the Bible how each is a guide for the life of a disciple of Jesus. We can use his statements on the cross as a guide for our lives. First of all, from Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, also prayed this prayer as he was being stoned to death. Many marvel at how they could forgive the very people who were murdering them. But that is our calling. No matter how big or small the sin is, is against us, if we want to be a follower of Jesus, we must forgive. Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, including the petition, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And the only comment he made on that prayer that he made afterwards was this. He said, if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Paul said also in Colossians chapter 3, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. I find it interesting he repeated, forgive. And that's what we're called to do, forgive. From John 19, 26 and 27, Jesus addressing his mother and his beloved disciples said, Behold your son. Behold your mother. One of the Ten Commandments says, Honor your father and your mother. Jesus was providing for the welfare of his mother, who was widowed by this time, even as he was dying. Now we can speculate as to why he entrusted her to John, a disciple, instead of one of his own brothers. But the point is, Jesus cared for her, and he made provision for her. Luke 23, verses 42 and 43. Jesus said to the repentant thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. We can use this statement as a source of never-dying, never-ending hope. We are also assured that our soul does not wait for eons until the judgment day to be united with Jesus in heaven. We pass immediately into his presence in glory, 
if we're believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we do so because we are united with Christ. We are also having the resurrection alive within us already. Jesus said in John chapter 5, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has already crossed over from death to life. Eternal life is part of who we are. Jesus also said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And also in John 17, verse 3, Jesus said, Eternal life is this, to know you, Holy Father, and to know Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Today you will be with me in paradise. From Matthew 27, verse 46, My God, why have you forsaken me? There are times when we feel forsaken by God. Jesus really was forsaken by God because he was bearing the sin of the world, and that was part of the deal. Uh, but bad things multiply in our lives, and we feel forsaken. It seems like no one is listening to our prayers, much less answering them. And yet God is still there. He is the one we turn to in good times or bad. Jesus took those words from Psalm 22, a prayer of David. And there are many such prayers of lament in the Psalms, prayers when people were down. Go ahead and cry out in your pain and frustration. God wants to hear whatever you're going through. But remember also the refrain from Psalm 42. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And we can surely remember also Jesus' promise, the very last thing he said in Matthew's Gospel. Behold, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. From John 19, 28, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And he could have said a lot of things about his physical condition while he was on the cross, but he chose to mention his thirst. Extreme thirst is like our spiritual longing for God. If not satisfied, we soon wither away. Amos wrote uh, some interesting things that really have to pertain with the cross. In fact, he also even prophesied about the darkness in midday. But he also said this, The days are coming, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. In Psalm 63, another one of those psalms that talk about a hard time, and again, David wrote this. He said, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Jesus promised, however, in the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, they will be satisfied. From John 19.30, Jesus said, It is finished. When doing hard things or simply living as a follower of Jesus, you will sometimes encounter opposition. You will get tired, or maybe you'll get discouraged. But persevere to the end. Jesus knew he would suffer and die. He knew what he was getting into. But he persisted. He went through with it, and he completed. He finished the work that he was sent to do. Only after finishing could he or we expect to receive our reward. Paul was also nearing the end of his life when he wrote the second letter to Timothy. He knew he would be sacrificed uh, that's the word he used, at least. He was actually going to be persecuted, uh, have his head cut off for being a martyr. Uh, but as he neared the end of his life, he said this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. 
and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul also said in Ephesians chapter 6, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. When you have done all that you can do, you will still be standing in the end. Do what you can. Finish and then stand. Jesus said, Be faithful even unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And from Luke 23, 46, Jesus said also on the cross, Into your hands I commit my spirit. God has given us life. If we give it back to him, will he treat that trust lightly? Of course not. He will regard that as the most precious gift we could give, which surely it is. Paul said this, I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Paul gave his life into God's hands, and God kept it for him until his time was over. Psalm 37, verse 5 and 6. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. And finally, Peter also writes in 1 Peter chapter 4, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. Commit yourself, body, soul, and spirit to the Lord, and He will take care of you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, even in your dying words on the cross, we can take your words as advice, as a commission, if you will, for our life. Your words from the cross, your words in dying, show us how to live. We pray that you would help us to take your words, your instructions, seriously. That you would help us to bear fruit according to uh, the earnestness with which we look to your word and put them uh, to practice in our lives. We thank you for this day that we call Good Friday, most of all because it was on this day you dealt with sin, you gave Satan the final blow that ensured his defeat. You overcame death by taking away its power, which is sin. We thank you for all that you have done for us. We look forward to not only living for you in this life, but living with you in the life to come, all because of what you did for us, dying for our sins that we might be forgiven. And so we thank you, we pray uh, for your blessing on our church, upon our lives, upon our families, upon our nation. And all this we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I invite you to join us on Easter morning at 10 o'clock as we celebrate our Lord's resurrection. Good evening.